real estate is very expensive. Uh, that makes sense. However, uh, most of the data center that we have in the United States is uh, we have it in like in a sub, sub uh, suburban area, so the real estate is not as high. Um, to cool that blade servers, for instance, uh, uh, takes about 3,000 watt per per blade servers, and that is if you put about three or four of those, uh, you can you can get up there 10 kW, 12, 15 kW rapidly. Uh, to cool that, and with our current infrastructure, it's almost impossible to cool that. So the next step is we're going to have to bring a, a chilled water system to cool that cabinet, which a lot of the vendors are starting to go to that route. Um, so it is a very difficult for us because when you start using a chilled water system in an open co-location space, um, and you mix up with the other other um, uh, co-location. Uh, low density power uh, ca cabinets, it's very hard to mix it up. So, so are, are you saying actually take, uh, have a chilled water plant and actually take chilled water, put it through coils in an in individual yeah. cabinet, have a fan running? That's correct. So basically it's a recycle within the cabinet. So so when you have a, a coil, it's probably, you know, it's, it's going to uh, sit in the back, back the heat, the hot aisle, mm -hmm. the back side of the cabinet. So all the heat will go through that coil and then recycle it back to the front side. So in order to do that, you have to have a really an enclosed space. If you do that in an open space and you mix it with the other air, it, it, it does not, it's not an efficient system. Are, are, are you, you guys concerned at all about having lots of water flowing around and through well, all of the, that, this equipment? That's the, uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I was working on, on a lot of the IBM facility, they used to have all this chilled water system and uh, Nobody wanted that chilled water into in, in their uh, racks and cabinets, but as the technology is changing, like what he said, going to blade servers and we can get up to 20 kW per cabinet. Uh, that's definitely an issue, and we we have no way out. Okay, I I would disagree. You have no way out. What? Well, I, well, I, I would actually please. disagree that you you have no way out. There are. So can we ask you to really talk into the mic? Okay. So people can't hear you. You really must talk okay. into the mic. Okay. Is that better? Okay. I would actually disagree. There are several ways of doing that, using different facilities and also sort of changing how you look at the delivery of that air. And also the question that I would ask is, how thermally efficient are those rooms in the first place? I, I, I would love to bring you on a tour of some of our data centers, and we'll, we'll let you sweat behind some servers for a while. Oh, no, I, I understand that the servers are running hot. I'm not, I'm not just <laughs> denying that. What I'm saying is, is that if you walk into most of the customer data centers I've been into, which is in the hundreds, yeah. um, most of the time they're maybe only operating at about 70% efficiency of the air that they have capacity to actually deliver. If you've got tile cutouts in the back of a server where you've got cables and that's a four foot, you know, four inch by eight inch opening, you're losing a lot of air there as opposed to using something like closed cell foam, using something like a bristle system to don't allow that air to escape, so you're actually getting more volume at the location where you actually need to deliver that air. All right, so I've got a 120,000 square foot floor plate, one of five floors, right? So, and I have to go and deliver that with disparate clients, talking 500 clients. I've got guys with, you know, you know, several GSRs in their space, you know, a bunch of Junipers, tons of servers, Sunboxes, HP boxes, IBMs, the 800s, Blades, every wacky thing you can imagine and every engineering re religion you can imagine. To try and engineer and, and do the cooling on that with all these variables, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. And it's a rack environment up to several thousand square feet. And some, you know, carriers drawing an average of, you know, 40 watts a square foot. We love them. We hug them. We kiss them. They're great. And then we got these, you know, hosting guy comes in and they, you know, they want to do 400 watts a square foot. And, and we, you know, we blink at them and say no and they think we're crazy. And then we have to spread them out and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, it, it's, it's a really difficult thing we're facing right now. And, and it, you know, most of us are, are pushing it to the limits, but it, it's something we all have to face. I, I can tell you one thing, by the way, and digressing, we, we're back on this file, I want to say something. We, we'll welcome liquid cooling, glycol, dielectric spray liquid on chips, whatever it takes, because in my opinion, it's not about power. I think we can all get the power in from the utilities now. Most of us put our data centers generally in the right locations to get those, you know, the big 13-2 feeds or whatever in from the utility. Um, the issue is moving air or, or somehow getting that stuff cooled down. And uh, either we vent it out or, or liquids or whatever, but that, that's the issue. It's really more cooling. Oh, no, C cooling is definitely the biggest problem. 
the issue that, that I would raise is one of the problems is how you're thinking about the space. And that is that you're dealing with it in watts per square foot as opposed to dealing with it in the specific requirements of the rack, which is what it eventually boils down to anyway. And if you have a method of doing that, at least you have a mechanism by which you can actually charge the customer based on the amount of heat that they're generating. Well, I believe that what you've done is you've lowered the cost of the port to the customer, but then you've driven the cost to us as the IDC providers where now we have to pass that cost on to customers in some form of either bigger space, um, charging for other services. But if you can rationalize that to them, that's actually allowing you to make the same, if not more, money, right? Yeah, it's the thing is, uh, when you have like 20 kW, 15 kW per cabinet, you try to cool that with the current infrastructure, and even if you open up that tile underneath, you can only bring so many CFM per tile. There's no way you can cool that unless you go with the chilled water system. Um, what about, what, I actually would disagree with that. Um, you can also do that by taking, because one of the biggest problems you have with air cooling is at some point within the height of that rack, what ends up happening is the air basically bleeds through. You're generating so much air being pulled through machines at either the bottom or the top of the rack, depending on where you're initially delivering the air, that the machines at either end of that spectrum are getting basically they're not getting any air. So have you actually considered using air systems that actually go from the bottom and from the top? Because now you're, you're not necessarily, you know, starving out for air one of those two locations, and you wouldn't necessarily have to do that with water. Well, the only thing I can tell you is you have to come out of data center and feel that, uh, you know, we're having a hard time cooling, like, even seven or 8,000 watts per cabinet. Those are hard to cool without a chilled water system. Okay, because I've got one in Menlo Park and we're doing 12 no problem and that's only with single delivery under the floor. Okay, so let's go do some questions from the audience. Randy? I'm Randy Bush, IJ. I'm going to put as hot stuff in there as I can cool because I want the power. That's life. Okay, now, the problem's the cooling over three, 4,000 kW per square meter with current air cooling, you're at the limit because people walking into the pop will get blown over physically. <laughs> the, the wind tunnel co-location effect. The chances of me putting water in my rack are rather small. You, you, you know, we, actually, we, we learned to take out the sprinkler systems. Right, I and mean, we, we have dry action sprinkler systems. How many folks here? Well, we want dry action cooling. Yeah. <laughs> How many folks here would be willing to have water flowing through their racks? Come on, everybody participate who would be willing to have water flowing through their racks. How many people here would say that's a deal breaker for me to have water flowing through my racks? I think what the people who said yes have water on their brains. <laughs> well, all right, what about glycol? Look. Everybody's scared of that. What there's, about dielectric liquid spraying there, on your chips? There, there's better ways to get airflow through the rack. Okay, you can side feed them and blow across them, etc. I'm going to sacrifice the square feet no matter what. Okay, but the fact is that most of your facilities today can't even hold 3KW per square meter. I think any bills which aren't doing that today are unrealistic. And I would like to know which of the, provi which of the build providers are actually providing three to four kW per meter. Okay. That, that's 300 to 400 per square foot approximately. Uh, I suspect the answer is none, but uh, <laughs> would anyone like to take that? I, I, have, I have some cabinets at NOTA, um, and I'll, I'll give uh, Akamai probably the hottest customer out there, um, Kuju's on this, where, where they have one cabinet, or several cabinets running about 386 watts a square foot at 75% breaker load all day long. And uh, the reason I can cool that, they have a very big hot aisle behind them, and uh, so they're spaced out, and they're around a lot of carriers who are running at about 40 watts a square foot, which is wonderful and great. That's the only reason we can do it. Um, I, I think Patrick Gilmore told me before that we're actually their, uh, their densest cabinets anywhere 
at that, at that kind of wattage per square foot load. Build your facility for 3K per square meter. Cool. Give me a half. I'm of, spaced out, too. I'm going to have to pay for it. Give me $500 million and I'll do it. No, no your, your problem raising your capital is somebody putting racks in there. It's my problem to pay for the cost so you can continue to have your rice bowl filled. Okay, but the reality is that I'm going to burn as hot as I can because I want to move those stupid little electrons. Okay, and I want you to give me a facility that can take as much as you can without blowing me off my feet when I walk into it. And give me, and raise the plenum higher and start talking about you know, cooling's coming up, air coming up the side of the rack and crossing it. Hello. Um, currently, we are, uh, Equinix is building a, a, like 4KW per cabinet uh, in the future. Uh, we're already planning on it. We're building on, you know, going forward in 2007. Uh, it takes about close to, you know, close to a year and a half the ca to start. The cabinet is about... One a cabinet is two square meters essentially because you have to walk down the aisle, so that's two kW. So, anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's going forward. We're building that data center, and going forward, we actually are starting to separate um, high density users, medium density users, and low density users. So. That's mm -hmm. what we're going for. I, I, and I, I think that's, that's a wave of the future is building, you know, high power density pods. Let's go to the uh, back center aisle. Hello, my name's uh, Derek Wise from GNI. Uh, we recently went through this with our data center in San Francisco. Uh, we deployed 1,008 IBM blade centers in a 12 cabinet environment. We're currently taking up 2,500 square feet. Uh, we have a ping pong table and uh, I think a soda machine and some other things in the adjacent cage that we left empty. Um, I think two, two to three hundred square foot per, I mean, watts per square foot is insignificant. For us, we need somewhere between two and twenty five hundred, I mean, twenty five hundred watts per square foot delivered on the floor to get the space requirements down to the actual amount. We're currently, um, we have the capacity to deliver. Can you try to speak a little more to the mic? Did you say twenty five hundred square foot? That was per square foot? 2,500 per That's square awesome. foot if we were delivering uh, the same cabinet space that you do. You typically deliver to about 2,000 per, per cabinet, 2,000 watts per cabinet, correct? And that equates to about eight servers. We get about 84 servers right now per cabinet, so you can do the math. It's about 20,000 watts per cabinet that we're able to deliver in power, uh, that we're able to deliver in equipment right now. That's 336 cores of processor power per cabinet that we're actually installing today. How are you able to cool 20 kilowatts per rack? Um, by buying a 2,500 square foot cage and putting a cabinet there, and a cabinet there, and a cabinet there. And that's currently the solution uh, that we have today. We don't like it. Um, we'd like to see some kind of direct cooling environments that are available for us. I'm currently paying for it anyway. I'm paying for 100 cabinets and have 12 installed. And that's that's how we pay for it. So um, how much this cost us, we're already dealing with it today. Um, but I'm still netting an efficiency. So I, I know we pick on our hardware providers pretty hard, but I want to kind of give them a little bit of kudo. I still get 3% better efficiency out of my math numbers every single month than I would if I'd put 84 one U pizza box servers in place and attempted to cool and pay for the environment that way. So there is some benefit from taking the Blade Center environments. And if our data centers can figure out a way to keep up with us, then um, I think we can also keep the space requirements a little smaller and maybe give ourselves another percentile or two of net gain. A, a little business hat thing here, you know, building from 100, 100 watts a square foot is what most everybody built around 2000, 2001, and yeah, great for spreading it out and cannibalizing, getting to 200 watts a square foot or more is great, but when you, when you start saying, I want to go to 200 watts a square foot baseline or 400 watts a square foot baseline, it's not a linear curve. It doesn't just, you know, just, oh, we just tack on some extra costs. It's exponential. It's, it's obscene. I mean, it, the, there's all kinds of new technologies you have to put in place, massive generators. Oh, and by the way, it's a fun thing. Generator lead time right now for a nice two megawatt diesel engine, it, yeah, it, it's up to a year, up to a year for one generator. So we can build all those raised floor or non-raised floor, do all the overhead, get all waiting, and we sit there and twiddle our thumbs for six months waiting for hopefully our generators to get delivered. And, and I guarantee you all of us have, you know, combined probably have about 40 generators in order. Uh, you know, and then take on every enterprise, all the government, everything else. It's, it's, 
You know, it, it is an exponential increase. So, it, you know, where Randy says, great, pass on those costs, and I want more, you know, more power and more cooling, and just make it happen, I can't wait to see the budget trauma when we start passing on those costs, because we're going to have to. It is what it is. The, the only thing that I'm proposing is let, let our demand generate some ingenuity. I'm not su suggesting you have an answer right now that you're not deploying. I'm suggesting think about it as much as you can. We're currently paying for it. There's a better way to do it. Someone's going to figure it out in a minute. And the Internet industry in general is short-sighted. Uh, we, we don't put enough in place to start with, or we don't really see how significant this growth can be. 22 million Blade servers are going to be installed in the United States this year. And who's going to cool them? Where are they going to be located? And how are you going to handle that demand when it comes up? You're going to have mountains and mountains of empty co-location space. Anyway, so just my comment, we actually had a trial in this. We actually did the math calculations, the power sums, and did all the drawings for our environment and how we're going to have to stagger out equipment based on the facility that got us to 200 watts per square foot. Um, and it was still a very significant burden from a, the amount of square footage space we had to take down to make it happen. Okay, okay Bill. There's one other dimension to this problem that I think is worth pointing out, which is when, when you build a brand new data center, the expected life is not just a couple of years, generally in the 10, 20, 30, 50 year type of time frame. So, it, I mean, it, I'd like to sort of shift to the other side of the, uh, the table there and talk a little bit about what kind of projections those of you who manufacture this hardware see for the power consumption towards the future. Do you believe it'll continue on linearly and grow in terms of how much you need? Do you think it will flatten out? Because those of us who are looking towards, you know, two to five years in the future have to, need, have to find out some kind of measure of what we should be constructing towards. So I open that up to you guys. I, 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 so from, from, from a technology point of view, um, until we have the next great uh, quantum leap, I mean, CMOS, I guess, was the last big help to us, um, and we don't know what that next great quantum leap is, we're going to be um, struggling incrementally to, to keep the power under control. So I see it continue to grow. And, and the, the, the things that can help, so the things that can help mitigate that a little bit, um, I think Randy mentioned a few things. I mean, we are fairly inefficient in terms of our cooling architecture, right? The amount of air that we can get through, we're forced to make bends in the, in the air paths. And, um, for example, on the CRS-1, where about 20% of our power goes to the fans, right, just to power the damn fans. So um, that, that can be, that can be a, a mitigation. The other thing is that just spreading out, spreading out the equipment, you know, as, as gross as it might seem, that, that is a mitigation. You know, the gentleman says he's already spacing his stuff out. Well, that's true in the router space as well, as well as the data center space. And so, you know, the advent... Um, of some of the vendors to do multi-chassis systems, at least for the large large routers, will enable the lead to at least do that. And how about Sun and Juniper? Do you guys see the power consumption continuing to grow linearly, flatten out, or? So I believe, as my colleague pointed out, um, it's going to continue to grow, and it's exasperated by the addition of features and functionality as we continue to push. Um, wire speed performance and increase the connection density um, so we go up to 40 gig connections and that begins to take on um, some light in the market. All of that's going to contribute to the addition of heat within the systems. We've got more gates providing that functionality that's required, pushing it at higher speeds. And I do think we are beginning to approach the physics limits of current process technologies. So I basically concur with what you're saying there. Cisco and Juniper agreed. Please note the date and time. <laughs> well, it is, you know, it is 6606. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, the other question that I would ask is if you look, so if you're talking about a 20-year sort of shelf life for your data center, if you were to go back and look at what data centers were generating from a power standpoint 20 years ago, it was actually about 5 to 10 watts a square foot. So if you look at going from five, or let's say you're going 10 watts a square foot, even to, you know, 100 times, let's say you go to 1,000 watts a square foot, um, we actually have greatly increased the amount of work that can be done by well over a factor of 1,000 since then. So, I mean, if you want a 20-year lifespan on your data center, I guess the one question I would ask, which is, do you expect over that 20 years for machines to be able to do the same amount of work they were doing 20 years ago? or a thousand times, 
because one of the problems we have now is as you start to draw, when you're drawing a watt and you double that to two watts, it's not really a huge deal. When you're drawing, you know, 5,000 watts, the next time you double that, that's 10,000 watts, 20,000 watts, 40,000 watts. So there's an element of geometric progression that's going on in terms of the power usage. So that's the other thing too, which is if you've got a data center you want for 20 years, how much more work do you want to be able to do within that 20 year time frame? Just to make a statement that people can throw back in my face 10 years from now, I want to say that no one will ever need more than 20 kilowatts per rack. It's right if it was 640K, right? Um, can I make a statement that he's wrong today? <laughs> so actually, I'd like to say one more thing to address your question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that it's going to be, and I know, I mean, history shows that, yes, uh, the progression is uh, up and to the right as far as power is concerned. Um, but uh, as, uh, as some of the guys have indicated, we're running into some roadblocks. And one of those things is that uh, when you get to these, you know, 100 million gate ASICs that you're just uh, packing so much density and so much power into one, one spot, it actually becomes extremely difficult just to actually sink that power out into the system. And so with those limits, you may actually see some hiccups where it may not be linear just because you reach a point where we'd like to add more density uh, but we just actually can't do it because that point source of heat is just too much. And as we've seen in like laptops on the Pentium and stuff like that, you run into just these, these tremendous problems of actually getting that heat from that point source out into the system. Patrick. Hi, Patrick from Akamai. Um, for the uh, Colo vendors, anybody putting a Colo in McMurdo base? I'm just wondering if that would be a good place. Can you, can you say that again? Speak up. It was a bad joke. I asked if anybody was putting a Colo in the South Pole. Um, as a... Uh, I don't know, as a brighter light, as a spot of hope, um, as the hottest colo in Terramark, which I will give kudos to, is the densest, best cooled um, colo we have on the planet. And that's saying quite a bit because we're in 2,500 locations. Um, we are actually finding that we don't need more power. We are coming to less power. Um, this is not true, I'm sure, for some people in the audience, but our, we are running into a problem where we have trouble getting enough spindles and the processors are getting faster in dual core and drawing less power at the same time. So in the last six months, we have actually found that we can go from 40 amp, stay at 40 amps a rack, which is very low for us, and we couldn't even fill the rack, but that's what most colos could provide and still not have to pay empty racks so that we could cool them. And we're now able to fill them at 40 amps a rack with servers and spindles and things like that. It's, this was not true six months or before. So um, I don't know if everyone is seeing this, but we're actually very happy that our power consumption is going down, not up. And we're getting more bits, more CPU, more everything out of the same number of amps, volts, watts. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, of course, you know, a year from now we'll need more power. But in the meantime, for the next 12 months, you guys are lucky. I would actually like to. Briefly, I mean, the fact that gentleman's talking about CMT or you know chip multi multiple cores on a chip, that is really a, a pretty big sort of leap right now that can save actually a fair amount of power. And I do work for Sun, and if you go and check out our Niagara systems, you will see that the workload that they do relative to the power they draw is actually considerably larger versus the amount of power. So whether it's us or anybody else that's doing chip multi-threading or multi-core chips, that is a way to look at to really be able to save some power because all of the other ancillary pieces are, there's actually a fair amount of power there. If you really look at a machine, about only 50% of the power is actually being used by the actual processor. The other 50% is being taken up by all the other ancillary things you need to, to actually run the system. RS? Rob Seastrom. Um, so, Bill started to sort of dance around this question and kind of back into it. We've certainly seen this happen before with data centers. Um, I remember May East uh, Mark III with additional Liebert challengers sort of wedged in wherever they could possibly get one. The question is, if one were to build a data center to four kilowatts per square meter or 4,000 watts per square foot or whatever's considered the state of the art right now. How long is that premium space versus no longer state of the art so you have to sell it at a discount? Is it even possible to do a data center with a 20 year life expectancy these days? Obviously it's possible to sell it for you know, some value of colo 10, 15 years from now. 
But the question is, is the run rate steep enough on the increase of power requirements that that's just a, a number that we're completely fooling ourselves with? And, and, and if, you're, uh, if your SEC compliance people won't let you answer that, that's fine too. No, I mean, look, this is all future thinking theory and, and what's going to happen from a business sense, but where, where all of us, you know, we three all have internet exchanges and we have lots of telcos and ISPs and none of them are running at the kind of density. It's really, it's really a displacement of server infrastructure that's causing the greatest heat. Um, or if somebody happens to have 20 GSRs at a row, you know, oh, that can be pretty rough too, or CRS1s or what have you, or, you know, big junipers or whatever it is. Um, the, I think what you're going to start to see is a separation of environment. Um, the ISPs and carriers aren't going to want to build in more fiber and redeploy this infrastructure because it's a little tougher to redeploy. They're going to want to have an exchange point server ISP environment where all the carriers, voice guys, VoIP, whatever the heck it is, is all sitting. And you'll see a separate either modular data center in a campus environment or in a multi-story building built specifically for server, as a server floor. And, and you try and isolate that stuff. Now, as far as the future goes, 20 years from now, you know, will it be obsolete? Maybe. Who knows? I think all of us have, we're all for-profit companies that we're going to, you know, battle like crazy to keep building to satisfy our customers. And as we fill up our space, we'll, we'll you know, find a, a lot next door or a lot down the road or in another city and closest to the cheapest power to acquire, which is a big thing right now, too, from the utilities, and, and build it. We're, you know, we're in business. So we're going to keep doing it to satisfy you guys and keep, it, keep the Internet working. Okay. Uh, Joel Krauska from Viata. A uh, question about the hardware vendors, uh, not the server space, because processors are now uh, becoming more efficient. Uh, what are, uh, what's coming in, in uh, network equipment? Can you shut down part of a fabric? Can you shut down half a line card if all the ports aren't in use? Or, or do these things exist now, or are you thinking about them? What can you talk about? Um, yeah, we certainly have, uh, in fact, it was kind of interesting, we had a bunch of service providers come and we, we, um, we asked that, that question and, and um, the, I guess the, the answer is if you make it automatic so I don't have to worry about it and no, nobody ever has to configure it, we'll consider it. But the, the, the response in, in general was pretty negative. So we have considered techniques like that. I, I just would remind, um, in terms of the bandwidth demand growth, right now it's, it's uh, the, from a router perspective anyway, and I think there's an analogy also to the CPU side. The exponential growth um, technology not only is not keeping up with it, but it's, it's, gonna, it's plateauing. So um, all these various, um, you know, multi-threaded ideas, um, um, having, you know, turning off idle, idle uh, portions of the logic that aren't being used, those are all great ideas and they're all great incremental improvements, but they're, they're kind of like one-time things that we can, we can try to do it in order to, um, to mitigate over the next few years. But the slope of the curve is, is not affected unless we do either do better technology. The other, the other thing to think about is maybe we need to just um, um, accept the fact that we need more space. There's a trade-off between space and power in terms of the, the density, right, power density. So, um, so today, um, I believe CRS1 also has high-speed, low-speed fans. So we are doing things like um, high-speed, low-speed fans so that we can reduce the power required under nominal conditions and only kick up um, when there's thermal extremes in the environment. Um, we're also looking at and have had similar conversations with customers with regards to acceptability of shutting down subsystems within the system. And it's typically been um, viewed with a little bit of a skeptical eye in terms of as long as it comes on exactly when I want it to, exactly when I need it to, but I don't want to have a protection circuit that's delayed in coming up because you're in a suppressed state, things like that. Um, back to also your comment with regards to having hotspots in the system. Um, I think that's, that's also a very valid point in terms of the density of the packages that we're putting into these systems today are pushing us in terms of being able to just design heat sinks that can, that can sink that into the enclosure itself and get that out of a geographic hotspot within the system. Um, we, do need, we do need to look at all of the incremental changes and, and additions that we can, but we also have to be mindful as a vendor of 
the reliability requirements and the uptime requirements of our customers. So there's also been some concern expressed in terms of thermal cycling certain portions of the system and having hot and cold regions uh, within, within the platform itself and what would that do in terms of aging and long-term um, characterization of the equipment. So those are some of the concerns that we've heard for doing mitigation steps like what had been asked about. Yeah, just to add one, the, <clears throat> one final thing on that to address your question is that we, we have also talked to customers about this and, and uh, given suggestions as to what we could do. And one of the issues we run into is that uh, in order to do a lot of these features where you turn down or you turn off portions of the design and then turn it back on, is that usually you have some, so, some sort of latency involved with that uh, where the circuit has to wake up and you have to essentially maybe buffer a packet or whatever that may be. And in a lot of cases, uh, people are sensitive, to, very sensitive to the latency as well as to, you know, jitter in the latency where you may have low latency in one application and then suddenly the latency increases. Uh, it affects software, uh, a lot of different software applications. So, yes, we've had requests for that, but uh, uh, the pushback has been uh, fairly, fairly large from a lot of, uh, a lot of other sources. So I think he was first. Okay. Go right ahead. Thanks to the gentleman over there. Um, my first question is to the, uh, the co-location vendors. When will power, I mean, when will heat or BTUs be a component of the charging? And, and to the server vendors, when will BTUs and, and the, the heat generated from the systems be a, a, one of the elements that people make decisions upon? It sounds like, sorry. it today sounds like. Today I said something rudely, sorry. It sounds like to me that there's no market for your problem. The, okay. the vendors aren't able to sell on this particular issue and the, I'm not charged for it. Okay, so, so we're, today, I, in terms of the IDCs, are you guys charging based on heat load? No, we're not. Uh, we will charge, we're charging customer, actually we're charging customer capacity, we sell capacity. Mm -hmm. So not by uh, the heat load. Is, is that something you guys anticipate doing at some point in the future? Power what? Hours of proxy free. Hours of proxy free, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, our, our costs are based on delivering space and delivering power and delivering cooling. And something people, which you mentioned a little bit, was cooling overhead. I don't think people pay attention to that, but it's a percentage of our cost of actually delivering the space that's wrapped into the cost that you pay us per square foot and for your power circuits. So we have, and our costs from utilities in general have gone up um, in some states by 30 and 40 percent because of our wonderful uh, Middle Eastern oil market. So uh, all of that is driving other things as well, which is making it more expensive, not only our ability to build and deliver it, but all that. Now, if any of you are happy to propose a BTU cost factor that I can charge you, I'm happy to do it. It's more money for us, right? Because we're not doing it now. So it might make it easier. I don't know. And, and are, are you guys seeing in, in your RFPs now that, that folks are putting in, uh, you know, heat generation limits or, or requirements of any kind? Is, is this something you guys are starting to see? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, a, a, a lot of our customers have kind of hard limits due to legacy, um, legacy buildings, right? So um, what we're, I mean, and the, uh, the way we've kind of approached it is kind of a silly, is, may seem silly, but building smaller systems with less slots is one way to approach it. <laughs> this is true. You have uh, a, did you have something? Yeah. So not directly uh, the, the dimensions you're asking about, but we have had people inquire about um, power efficiency for the routers in terms of gigabits per kilowatt, for example, as a way of measuring system capacity for comparison's sake. The other thing also is a lot of education. When you look at total cost of ownership for any device, whether it's a switch, a server, what have you, um, that total cost is dependent not only on the hardware, software, support cost, but also the power cost. And you're getting devices now, you can go and buy a server for $700 and at eight cents a kilowatt hour, which is sort of pretty close to what we pay in this area, for example, it's actually gonna cost you more over the course of a year to power and cool that box than it will be for the cost of the box. That's, so That's extremely interesting. Lane Patterson, Equinix. Uh, quick question to the vendors. I think um, an interesting point might be to um, 
a T640, if you were to redesign that today, what fraction of the power budget would it require compared to the existing model? And if you project that ahead to the next generation of stuff that you build, um, what I hear is people saying, hey, I can do 4x the density and speed and throughput with only 30, 40 percent more power. How much um, of that decision making goes into your next generation of, hey, I have to come up with something that I can fit in the same power footprint as my last gen? So um, in terms of developing product requirements to meet um, those kinds of requests, we are seeing definitely requests for holding the line on power density, but we're also seeing requests for increases in throughput and capacity. So I don't think it's um, practical for me to be able to go forward to my customers and promise a doubling of capacity and holding, holding power consumption flat, but we're definitely working um, towards trying to reduce overall system capacity through whatever mitigation steps we can take in the course of the design. So I guess what, I'm, what I want to leave you with is it is not an afterthought. It is being factored into um, requirements and being, being synthesized into the engineering process from the ground up as we're going forward. I, I guess I would just, just reiterate that we're, we're at a point now going in the forward in the future where we have to, you know, there's probably a set of tricks in our bags that we haven't used yet. So we can probably hold, you know, we can hold the line somewhat um, over the maybe a generation or two, and that's what we'll do. And, um, you know, going forward beyond that, um, I think we have to maybe think about um, alternative architectures for POPs. Or merge the racks in liquid nitrogen. You guys uh, get that stuff ready and we'll, you know, lower it in the tanks and well, put it out I'll, for maintenance. I'll, I'll throw out one question that I have kind of to the audience is that, you know, um, in terms of uh, there is somewhat a, uh, there is a space versus uh, cooling efficiency trade off that we can make to, you know, to some degree. Um, so would it, you know, why, why don't we build pops that are, you know, in cheaper locations and backhaul more stuff? Yeah. That's why you backhaul it. You backhaul uh, the traffic. Hi, right? hi, Jared Monch, NTT America. If I have to backhaul more stuff, I have the challenge of uh, right now I'm, I'm seeing uh, individual customer growth that is uh, 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 rather huge. You know, the, the numbers as far as customer growth that I've heard earlier today seem about right for traffic. And right now, no vendors are uh, providing uh, interfaces greater than uh, 40 gig right now. And not in the foreseeable future, uh, certainly not in at least the next two years am I going to be able to do anything uh, faster than that based on rough estimates and timelines that I've heard. Uh, and so backhauling stuff means that you're aggregating more stuff in a single location and you need faster uh, link speeds in those locations as a result of that to be able to deal with that. So that's not really an option. In fact, it's really more what of a about trying to fix. Well, I'm sorry. Wavelengths? Uh, there's significant problems, as you may know, with uh, any sort of hashing algorithms to balance stuff across multiple wa wavelengths. So if I have individual customers coming to me and delivering 10 gigs of traffic to me in a location, and they're going to be doubling that every year for the next several years, how am I going to be handling that over long distances, local distances, and such if the fastest interface speed I can get is 4x that internally. And this is a significant engineering challenge that I think we're all really facing. And the, the, as the, the media companies continue to do what they've been doing recently, which is saying, hey, we can make money selling TV shows on the internet in the past six months and stuff like that and sell movies and whatnot, I think it's really going to be a significant thing and we may see past the 2x growth uh, for a little while as people start to get the faster FIOS services into their home and everything else. And it's without any sort of faster uh, capacity out of the, the, the vendors for the individual link speeds, this is a huge challenge. And this really has uh, me personally actually somewhat scared about what we're going to be doing about this to solve it in long term. Okay, we'll, we'll just be taking questions from the people who are standing up right now, actually, since we're almost out of time. Over here. Avi Friedman. Um, I talked to a lot of people who are looking to do storage, video streaming, Usenet news, things that, that are very, very disk intensive. 
I'm interested that Rackable, I don't know whether Rackable Systems was invited, but I see, a lot, I see them a lot for people who are looking for very dense disk solutions. And I also have a question for Sun regarding the coming Thumper product. Uh, 48 disks for you, you know, sort of no matter how many processors you have in it, looks like it starts to generate a lot of heat. Uh, another, so first question is, what is the heat profile of a rack full of those? Um, second question is, is there any work to do something like a 4U 196 laptop disk box? Um, does heat really come into it for people who are basically saying, I need IOPS, or, you know, I just need so many terabytes of storage per rack unit? Um, I can't give you a specific answer on that because those products, well, they showed up in Jonathan's blog. They haven't actually shipped yet. Um, I can tell you that that area is being looked into. I think the other thing that we're looking at, whether it's from, you know, uh, a blade box full of disks or a blade box full of processors, there are going to be certain limitations that we're going to tell people. And it's going to pretty much be, if you want to put this in, you've got to sort of show us that you have the capacity in the location you're going to put it in to cool it. Or, thank you, Yan Yon, good night. Um, that's one of the other things that, you know, taking, there's a responsibility that we have to make sure that we can give you accurate power information on, you know, that type of work. The other responsibility is also to the people who are installing it to make sure that they're installing in a location where it can meet the requirements of the box that it has. And I think that's one of the areas where historically a lot of vendors, including Sun, have really sort of dropped the ball, which is letting people go and install stuff in areas where they couldn't realistically support it, particularly from a thermal standpoint. And that does cause failures. We know that if you're running stuff very, very hot, it will decrease the, the mean time between failure. So I think that's one of the other things that we're working on now, and I know some of the other vendors are as well. Okay. Randy. Oh. Okay, off to the right. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just suggest that uh, this is Phil for Myers Prime, Phil Rosenthal. Um, the worst offenders in terms of hardware really are not the people that are on the panel. In fact, they're pretty good, all the, things considered. That's, that's why they showed up. Uh, exactly. And... Uh, I'd like to point out to the audience that they really should be putting pressure on the vendors that are producing these one-use servers that if you look at the profile of where the power is going, greater than 50% of the power is going towards the processors. And I don't know about everyone else's, but for us, if you look at a server, say, for example, a Dell 1650 from five years ago versus a Dell 1850 today, they're doing similar bandwidth because the customers have similar needs. Uh, we have more of them. And the processor time, they're sitting at 90% idle on both of them. So do we really need these bigger, faster, more power-hungry processors in greater density for our bottom-of-the-line servers that you can buy today? Um, I really think that that's not the case, and vendors really need to start offering more uh, power-efficient, you know, using laptop processors instead of Xeons. Um, and also I'd, I'd like to point out what uh, Patrick said, that they're reaching a plateau in terms of disk density. I know for a fact that uh, a lot of the vendors we're buying from are going to start distributing servers using smaller miniaturized, uh, I mean, basically laptop drives, but with higher performance spindles. So you're going to see greater density for that coming very soon. And I mean, there wasn't really a question. I just wanted to make a statement. Hey, excellent comment. There, there is one area. There is one area, and this is true for you know basically all the vendors that are working on it, which is the area of virtualization. And that, you know, it, the biggest issue there from a, particularly from a power and cooling standpoint, which is the point that the gentleman made, which is most of those machines are only doing about, they're not idle 90% of the time. So I guess one of the other questions is if you could actually get your machines to actually be in use 80% of the time in that workload that they're doing, would you need nearly as many of them generating, sucking nearly as much power and generating nearly as much heat? Show of hands, anybody? 
I, I think one thing we see in the market now, particularly in the hosting market, is that there's really a widespread adoption of virtualization. You know, I think a lot of the dedicated hosting market in particular is, you, you know, except for the higher end managed hosting, the, the I'm going to rent a Dell box market is, is starting to rapidly go by the, the wayside in favor of, of virtualized private servers. I mean, so that's definitely being seen in the marketplace. Yeah, I'd like to make another comment on that, uh, vendors. Uh, what we have seen, uh, I think what I, I kind of like what they did uh, is that uh, we have seen the, our neutral currencies dropped quite a bit because of uh, a lot of the servers now these days, they require 208 volt instead of 120 volt. That re eliminates the uh, neutral phase that the, uh, generates less heat to the uh, data center as well. So that is something that you guys did really well. Thank you. Randy. On my left, I've got a large crew singing I want my P2P. Yeah, I'll virtualize. Yeah, I'm squeezing it down. But I got more of them. So I'm still going to have max heat in the rack. I'm talking intimately with the router vendors and some of the server vendors. They're working real hard to do what they can. But when I go to the colo vendors in 2000, went to the newest facility in the Redlands. Had to, with this is technology that's now six years old. We weren't even using the latest stuff we were trying to install then. We had to leave one third of the facility empty. We were going to open a bistro in it. <laughs> Bill, you tell me you're designing for 50 years. You're not designing for today. I'm trying to tell you I need 3 to 4K per square meter today. And other people who are trying to stick blade servers in are twice that. And that's not tomorrow, that's today. Okay, one last comment or question. Uh, Tim Alicio with uh, New Metra. To what extent, and I'd like to hear this from both sides, opinions on both sides, to what extent do you think standardization of things like, let's say, using larger, more efficient power supplies or standardizing cabinets so you get a better airflow or you can reduce having to have internal cooling fans, which also are going to suck power, to what extent do you think that can help mitigate this problem and are there any efforts in, in that area going on right now? Okay. Let's start with the hardware guys. So I think that actually could be uh, very helpful. I know that there are some efforts on the, if you go into like the uh, IEEE meetings, there's some efforts on the physical layer side to, to look into power reduction. But whenever you standardize something, generally you get the economies of scale, you get the more uh, research and development investment. And we've seen that uh, if we look at our products, and I look at the standardized products that uh, go into our design versus the non-standardized products, in general, uh, just the economies of scale and the amount of investment that goes into it, you get a much more efficient product. Um, I, I think that one thing that might help would be, um, I mean, I think we're, we're working towards, at least in the kind of the telecom router area, we're working to kind of old standards. So I think a new, a, a new standard that, that redefines what a rack really means, um, maybe something that looks at what airflow architectures really mean. I think that, that would be a big help. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the other stuff, the other stuff, yeah, we can get, um, the, the more dollars we get into a particular area, we can, um, we can do a better job of optimizing, but I think, you know, we're kind of hamstrung, again, by technology. I keep harping on that subject. But. So standardization along the lines of things that you're talking about, um, mechanicals, airflow systems, things like that would go a great deal towards um, helping the situation within the context of uh, a system in and of itself. Um, I think we're always going to see optimized designs for specific products internal to the system, but the enclosures, the physicals, um, and the outside plant from the router's perspective, it would help a good deal if there were, if there was something that resembled design guidelines or, or a target to shoot towards. And there again, you'd be working on top of economies of scale that colleagues have spoke to. There is a lot of standardization that's going on, you know, from, a, you know, everybody's trying to use, you know, multi-speed fans and use them when you need them and stuff like that. The biggest change I think you're going to see is that now, 
there are sort of three organizations. Um, right now, SPEC, which is actually working on a power benchmark. Uh, the ECHO Forum, which is being driven by um, the EPA. Um, they're actually looking at an energy, trying to, trying to actually create an energy star metric for servers. Energy star blade servers. Yes. Yikes. Um, at some point, I mean, this is one of the things that we're working on right now. And then also what's called the green grid. And so what you're going to start to see as these benchmarks start to come out and customers really start to ask for it, which is all the vendors, whether it's the server vendors, the storage vendors, the network vendors, one of the things that they're going to be able to compete on is how much work are you doing given how much power are you sucking and how much heat are you generating? And that's actually probably the single biggest thing that the users, our end user customers and all the people who, you know, buy this in the industry can actually do, which is make us compete on how efficiently we use power and generate heat because then you're going to decide with your dollars who's going to win. And it, when it comes down to, you know, who's going to make money doing this and if I can create a, a, a more efficient power utilization server at a given load than my competitor and you're actually going to buy it, that motivates me to find other reasons to do it. But to say, I'm not, you know, you could save all the power you want, but I'm still not going to buy your product. Well, that sort of tells us, guess what? You're not willing to pay for power efficiency. So part of it is you have to tell us and you also have to vote with your dollars, as it were. It's, it's nice to have um, metrics that you can measure to help compete, but I'm thinking specifically, are the vendors talking to each other about ways that they can do things in common ways so that um, they'll, they can be more inefficient, inefficient if they're working together at a data center, if they're adjacent to each other at a data center, let's say. Or they want to interact with what the carriers, I mean, I'm sorry, what the facilities might have built. The one thing that, that has happened, which is ASHRAE, the American Association of Hitting Refrigeration Engineering, um, has come out with a spec that sort of says, okay, you know, machines need to be cooled front to back and fans need to be variable speed and stuff like that. And so at least that is one small area that you have a lot of vendors now that are trying to build machines that at least meet those specs. I don't, I don't think personally, and this is just my own personal opinion, um, you're going to actually see vendors wanting to work together. I mean, I certainly don't want to tell, you know, HP how to build cooler machines that draw less power because that's a competitive advantage for me. Um, there are going to be some standards, but in terms of things that we really think are a leap forward, um, say some stuff that we did with, you know, chip multi-threading, we don't want to make that publicly available and give it to my competitor because that's the way I can make money. I can differentiate myself in the market. Okay. Um, very briefly, just to wind things up, uh, this has been an excellent panel. I'd like each of the folks on the panel on both sides in 30 seconds or less to give one thing that they would like to see the folks at the other table do to help the situation, just, just to sort of wind things up. So let, let's start, uh, start at the end. Well, I think basically from um, the data center side, we, are, we would request for vendors to, as I say, design more efficient power supplies, um, more efficient equipment, because at the end of the day, we have to figure out a way of how to dissipate that heat out of the data center, and that's our biggest challenge. Um, well, we've been, you know, out in, with Equinix, we've been challenged by uh, uh, the power density and customers a lot of times they do not understand the, the statement of like spreading out the load. They like to put everything in a condensed mode or in a compact, uh, as small as cage as possible. Uh, we want them to understand the, uh, uh, the heat load and able to dissipate the heat. You need to understand, we need to distribute this uh, cabinets, spread them out so that uh, we can cool you guys uh, properly. I, uh, you know, we're all, we're all building really hot, you know, or, excuse me, well-powered big data centers now. I think I'd like to see um, all the vendors come into our IDCs, not enterprise data centers, but IDCs, which are a combination of enterprises and ISPs and hosters and everything, and, and start testing their hardware in a real world environment. Um, let's work on thermodynamics and fluid dynamic issues and bring it into our data centers. We all have labs, we'll put it in the middle of the floor and see if it melts something or doesn't. 
and you know we'll we'll put some glycol taps in it. We'll put some liquid stuff. See what happens, and we're happy to do it because it benefits us and our customers later on. Um, building a data center is a slow moving iceberg. You know, building a server might be a lot faster. It takes a long time to build a data center. So let's work together on that. I do have one more thing here. Um, when you guys are not using the, the, the rack, if you're not using a certain uh, the space, use a blanket, uh, the blanket, so you can isolate the cold aisle to the hot aisle. So it'll, it'll, it'll help the airflow much, much better. That, that, that's interesting. How, how much do you think that in an average facility, would, would putting a blank up, how much do you think that would help? Oh, it'll help a lot. Uh, really? It'll really help a lot. Uh, right now, you got a lot of leakage going from cold aisle to the hot aisle. So if you if you cover that up, you're going to have a lot better. Uh, it's efficient, very efficient system. That, that's actually the fluid dynamic comment I was talking about. I think that's what got him inspired. That you, you have a seven foot forty two cabinet, and you uh, and you know the middle of it is totally empty. The the air, the you know, and you're in a raised floor environment. The air is going to flow up through that hole and shoot back, and the top servers are going to run it in ninety nine degrees. The ones below there are going to run at seventy two degrees, and everything's going wrong, and you're complaining to the vendor, and it causes all kinds of operational and flow control issues for us. You put blanks in, holy cow, it all works, and it's much more efficient, and there's less uh, you know cannibalization of space going on. Okay, hardware guys. First answer that I can tell you on all of our stuff, we actually supply those now. And if you actually go to PG&E's website, we actually did some work with them recently to actually try to measure what the increased efficiency is if you have those blanks and it was fairly sizable. The biggest thing I would ask is, one is education, not just amongst yourselves, but also to your customers, and to please stop using watts per square foot to define your data center. It is a fundamentally flawed view of the world because it's making the assumption that the heat load is even and across a data center it never is. Um, if you really start dealing with it in terms of a per rack basis, that makes it a lot easier to understand and justify the requirements that you have. So that would be the one thing that I would ask. So for me, what I'd like to actually see, and this goes back to one of the questions out there, is that if the, uh, all the uh, uh, IDC groups got together and if there was some sort of forum or group that could actually uh, work with us, uh, we'd be very happy to do that. One of the issues that we run into in a lot of our customers is everybody has different requirements, uh, and we try to you know, fit all these requirements into our design, and it turns out that then we're sort of basically uh, doing trade-offs for all these requirements and, and we can't optimize for any one application. But if we had a, a sort of a general consensus across the board, we could probably do it much more effectively. Um, I guess for me would be, um, again, to get together, I think that the last question had a good suggestion in terms of standardization or uh, get a group of the IDC people. We need to get some service providers that um, do their own facilities. And, and vendors such as you know, Force 10 and Juniper and Cisco, and, and try to strategize on what um, a facility architecture should look like for the, for the next generation. I think we've been dealing with, with legacy uh, architectures for too long. So I'd, I'd, I'd hope we'd come up with a, an architecture that would make uh, cooling easier, make the airflow easier. Um, that would go a, a big ways to, to helping us uh, reduce the amount of power that we consume just in fans, for example. So. Today is a vendor when we um, are see RFPs from our customers there all over the place with regards to what the requirements for the environmentals look like. Um, they're, maybe that's a little bit of hyperbole, but they are, they are quite, quite diverse in the needs that we see. So it would help a lot to have some common, common standards, that, standards that people are shooting towards in terms of data center designs. Also, um, to update some of the nomenclature would help a great deal, as you were describing, with regards to taking a look at the amount of power for the amount of work required. Um, from the router perspective, we look at things in terms of gigabits per kilowatt consumed, or the reciprocal of that, kilowatts per gig that's necessary. Um, so some common language like that, I believe, would help us a lot as well. Thanks. I, I'd like to thank the panel for the great work. Uh, I'd like to thank Michael, David, Brad, Rob, Josh, Jay, and Brian. Outstanding job. Thank you.